Hey folks, um, so today we're going to have a look at a high income country that has had a big um, earthquake. So this is your earthquake case study for a high income country. Now, I have covered this one before on a previous video, but I thought I'd give it a whole uh, infographic of its own um, instead of just comparing it to uh, Nepal. Um, so we're going to do this one separately. So this is the Chile earthquake, okay, which is in South America, and it happened in 2010. Now, you won't have seen huge amounts of news on this one, largely because, luckily, not the effects of it were, t were bad, but they weren't too bad. They could have been a lot worse. But because it's a high-income country, it actually um, coped rather well. So if you just split your page like so, okay, um, what we're going to do is we're going to start looking over here at the impacts and then we'll move on to the short and long term responses. So, right, impacts, capitals, okay, so it was an 8.8 .8 magnitude uh, on the Richter scale earthquake, okay, it's a big earthquake, yet luckily only 500 people died, um, which is very, very sad. Every single one of those deaths is sad, but that, that number is low considering the size of the earthquake. Um, what next? Uh, 12,000, so this is a bigger number, okay? 12,000 people, if you're a non-stick person, um, were affected in terms of, they were injured from falling debris, from being, uh, you know, part of their body crushed or, you know, having difficulties related to the earthquake. So if we draw like, they needed kind of hospital attention, okay, medical attention. Okay, so that's quite a high number. But again, for a city, for a big earthquake like this, again, that number could be much bigger. Um, but in total, so if you draw one last kick person, this number is a lot bigger, 800 thousand, so nearly a million people, uh, were affected. Okay, now that word can mean a lot of things. Not physically hurt, but stressed from the event, um, not physically hurt or, or, or died, but and needing to be move house or didn't have water or uh, electricity for a day or, or so. All right, so there were, there were some issues and um, there was also quite a large tsunami. We'll come to that in a second, but the, the worst thing Possibly the worst thing, although you know you could you could decide if this is true for you or not, um, is the is the economic cost. Okay, now a lot of these buildings crumbled and cracked. So I'll just draw uh, lots of cracks like this. Um, there's some amazing pictures online if you look it up uh, of the damage, but the biggest impact, okay, was economic. And, and you really do want to mention this, okay? It was thirty billion dollars, okay, um, to rebuild, okay, the cost of repair and rebuild. And that is a massive sum of money, okay. Even for a wealthy country, that's a huge sum of money, okay. So by far and above, the biggest impact was economic, okay, and then and then social. Um, so yeah, what else happened? There was also uh, a lack of power. So power was out. Um, there was a problem with water supplies. So they were affected. So we just draw a little water droplet there. Um, phone lines went down as well. Um, so that would have come in under power. Phones. Okay, um, and roads were, key roads were affected, but I'll come to this in a minute, but not for long. Okay, so roads were damaged. Um, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then coastal towns, so if you draw like a wave like this, uh, we want to put a tsunami. So it's a, it's a destructive plate margin, so that's where one plate is subducting under the other one. Uh, the oceanic plate was under the continental plate and what it did is it did cause um, a tsunami um, so 
coastal towns were affected. Coastal towns were affected by the tsunami. Okay. Um, so yeah, so quite significant, arguably, all of those impacts. But like I said earlier, if this had been a low-income country, it would have really had much higher numbers in terms of deaths, um, although the cost would have been less to repair. So there's sort of a uh, an interesting argument there. So over here, let's have our uh, immediate. These are going to be our immediate responses. Now, in an exam, you could get a question asking about the impacts, primary or secondary impacts. You could also get a question that's asking just purely about the responses. So that's your immediate or what we call long-term responses. Now, generally speaking, immediate responses want to be in the first 24 to 48 hours. And then long-term responses are anything after that. Now, this will amaze you, but Chile, it's a rich country, it's a high-income country. Uh, I think it's 41st out, uh, for its HDI ranking. Uh, in fact, we might put that over here. Let's put that over here. So it is 41st out of 187 for its Human Development Index ranking. Now, uh, that's not just money. That is literacy rate, um, access to its life expectancy, access to doctors and things. It's it's a wealth country, okay? And they were actually able, if we draw a road, okay, they were able to repair their key roads in 24 hours following the quake. Okay. So this was an immediate response, okay? Key roads repaired in 24 hours. Okay. Which is quite incredible. That that meant then that they could get medical attention and support in place because they could access everywhere. So they got the roads done very, very quickly. Uh, the next thing was um, electricity. So you can see those um, electricity lines going around the country. Okay, these were damaged, obviously, during the earthquake, but they were very quickly repaired. So power, power lines, and water. Now water is under the ground, so it's a difficult one to draw. You can draw a water droplet. Um, all of that was restored in 10 days. Okay, that's incredible, absolutely incredible um, to be able to do that. So it just showed just how incredible they are really, how, how well they did. Um, right, so then moving on. What we need to have a look at now is their long-term responses. Now, it, I think we have to just make it clear, long-term is a little while, um, and it actually took them, so let's put this in brackets, it took them four years to make a, what we would call a full okay, recovery. But they did this through their own methods, you know, their own strong economy and the government. So, you know, Yes, it took them a bit of time, but they did it themselves, okay? Um, and then the key thing, the thing that everybody talks about with this case study is they somehow managed to make 30,000 of these um, emergency uh, wooden, they were made of wood, uh, shelters, okay? Now these homes, they sound basic, don't they? just like a cabin, but these were really good. They were really good homes and they were able to um, house people, to keep them safe so they're not vulnerable. Um, they uh, went so far as to allow them to uh, sort of buy into this program and, and later on actually improve these buildings and turn them into, you know, really great homes, you know. And they did this. 30,000 of them, I, st I find it absolutely staggering what they did. And it was an example, really, to the rest of the world uh, as to how to protect your population. You know, if you really want to save people's lives from disasters like this, you've got to keep them safe. So they were safe. Uh, they were not vulnerable to other people, weather, etc. 
Um, they had power, water, they were cheap, they, um, really, really accessible for people. So um, just remember that this is, this is a big number, okay, 30,000 of these properties. And they were built outside of the tsunami risk zone as well. So there was no chance of them. And they're still standing today, you know, and they're doing a great job protecting their population. So there you go. That's uh, a little roundup on Chile earthquake. And I'll do another one of these, a separate one for Nepal. All right, best of luck.